and continuing Pliny's Natural History Book 2, chapters 24 through 37 are shorter, and he discusses various uh, meteoric phenomena. Capita Viginticuator Idem hi parcus, numquam satis laudatus, utqua nemo magis ad probaverit, cognationem cum homines iderum animasque nostras partem esse caeli, novam stellarum in aevo suo genitam deprehendit, aeusque motu qua fuisit ad dubitationem est, a ductus anne hoc saepius vieret, movere turque, et ea quas putamus ad fixas. Etioque ausus rem etiam deo improbam, ad numerare postri stelle, stellas ac sidera ad nomen expungere organis ex cogitatis, per quae singularum loca atque magnitudines signaret. Ut facile di scerni posset ex eo non modo an obirent, ac nascerentur sed an omnino aliquae transirent, moverent turque, item an crescerent, mi nurerent turque, caelo in hederititate cunctis relicto. Si quisquam qui cretionem, eam capret in ventus esset. Capita viginte quinque. E mi cant, et facis non nisi cum decidunt visae, qualis germanico caesare gladiatorum spectaculum, edente praeter ora populi meridiano transuptucurit. Duo genera earum, altarum lampades, vocant, plane faces, altarum bolitas, quale mutinensibus malis visumst. Distant quod faces vestigia, longa faciunt, priore ardente parte, bolis vero perpetua ardens longiorum trahit limitem. Capita vigente sexto. E micant et trapes simili modo, quas docaus vocant, qualis cum Lacedaemonii classi victi imperium Graciae a misere. Fit et caeli ipsius hiatus, quod vocant casma, capita viginti septima, fit et sanguinea species et quo nihil terribilius mortalium timori est. Incendium ad terras cadens inde, sicut Olympiadis, centesimae septimae anno tertio, cum rex Philippus Graeciam quateret. At quego haec statis temporis, naturae vi ut cetera arbitror existere, non ut plerique vari iste causis quas ingeniorum acumen ex cogitat. Quipe in gentium malorum fuere praenuntia, sed ea acedise non quia haec facta sunt arbitror. Verum haec ideo facta quia in casura erant illa, raritate autem occultam eorum esse rationem. Ideoque non sicut exortus supradictos defectusque et multa alia nosci. Capita viginti octu. Cernuntur et stellae cum sole totis diebus, plerumque et circa solis orbem, ceu spiciae coronae et versicolores circuli, qualiter augusto caesare in prima juventa urbem intrante post obitum, patris ad nomen ingens capesendum. Ex Distunt eadem coronae circa lunam et circa nobilia astra caeloque inherentia. Capita unde triginti. Circa solem arcus. 
Circa solum arcus ad paruit, Lucio opimio, quintio Fabio, quod syllabus orbis Lucio porcio marcelio Achilio, circulus rubris coloris, Lucio Julio publio rutilio consilibus. Capita triginta. Fiunt pro digiosi et longi ore solis de factus, qualis occiso dictatore caesare et Antoniano bello totius paene anne palore continuo. Capita triginte uno. Et russus soles plures simul cernuntur, nec supra ipsum, nec infra sed ex obliquo, numquam juxta sed contra terram, nec noctu sed aut oriente aut occidente. Semel et meridie conspecti in bosporo produntur, qui ab matudino tempore dura verunt in ocasum. Trinos soles antiqui saepius videre, sicut septemius postimio, quintius mucio et quintus marcio, marco porcio et marco antononio, publio dolabella et marco lepido, Lucio Planco consilibus, et nostra aetas vidit divo Claudio principe, consulato eius Cornelio Orfito collega. Plures quam tres simul visi ad hoc aevi num quam produntur. Capita triginti duo, lunae quoque triniae, ut gnaium domitio, Gaius Fanio consilibus, apparuer. Capito triginte trio. Quod plerique apelaverunt soles nocturnos, lumem de caelo nocto visum est, Gaio Caecilio, Cnaeus Papirio consulibus, et saepe alias, ut diei species nocte luceret. Capita triginte quarta. Clipeus ardens. Ab ocasu ad ortum scintilans transcurruit solis ocasu Lucio Valerio, Gaio Mario consulibus. Capita triginti quinto. Scintilam visam e stella cadere et augeri terrae ad propinquatem, at postquam lunae magnitudine facta sit, in luxisse ceo nobilo die. Dein cum in caelum se recuperet, lampadem factam semel umquam proditur cnae octavio Gaio Scribonio consulibus. Vidit id silanos pro consul cum comitato suo. Capita triginti sexta. Fieri videntur et discursus stellarum, Numquam temere ut non ex ea parte, truces venti, coro iantur. Triginta septima. Existunt stellae et in mari terrisque, vidi nocturnis militum vigiliis in haerer pilis pro vallo fulgurum efficie eas, et Antemnis navigantium lad iisque navium partibus cum vocali quodam sono insistunt, ut volucres sedem ex sede matutant mutantes, graues cum solitia solitariae venere, murgentesque navigia, et si in carinae ima deciderint, exurentes geminae autem salutares, et Pros, prosperi cursus praenuntiae, quarum adventu fugari diram ilam ac minacem, apelatamque Helenam fuerunt, et ob id poluci ac castoriis nominad signant, eosque in mari deos invocant. Ominum quoque capita, vespertinis oris magno praesacio, circum fugent, Omnia incerta ratione et in naturae majestate abdita. So is he talking about St. Elmo's fire or about ball lightning? One of those two things. Capita. Oh, okay, that was it. That was 37. Now let's go back and read the English.
starting at 34, right? Oh, right. Hipparchus, who is said to have discovered astronomy. But I think the point that um, Pliny is making in this paragraph is the art of astronomy is so old. Like, it's as old as civilization, so how could any individual have invented it? Nevertheless, chapter 34. Hipparchus, before mentioned, who can never be sufficiently praised, no one having done more to prove that man is related to the stars and that our souls are a part of heaven, detected a new star that came into existence during his lifetime. The movement of this star in its line of radiance led him to wonder whether this was a frequent occurrence, whether the stars that we think to be fixed are also in motion. And consequently, he did a bold thing, one that would be reprehensible even for God. He dared to schedule the stars for posterity, and to tick off the heavenly bodies by name in a list, devising a machinery by means of which indicate their several positions and magnitudes, in order that, from that time onward, it might be possible easily to discern not only whether stars perish and are born, but whether some are in transit and in motion, also whether they increase or decrease in magnitude, thus bequeathing the heavens as a legacy to all mankind. Supposing that anybody had been found to claim that inheritance. Chapter 25 There are also meteoric lights that are only seen when falling. For instance, one that ran across the sky at midday in full view of the public when Germanicus Caesar was giving a gladiatorial show. Of these there are two kinds, one sort called lampades, which means torches, the other bully days, missiles. These are the sort that appeared at the time of the disasters of Modena. The difference between them is that the torches make long tracks with their front part glowing, whereas the bullides glow throughout their length and trace a longer path. Chapter 27, 26. Other similar meteoric lights are beams, called in the Greek dokoi. For example, one that appeared when the Spartans were defeated at sea and lost the empire of Greece. There also occurs a yawning of the actual sky called a kasma, chapter 27, and also something that looks like blood and fire that falls from this chasm to the earth, the most alarming possible cause of terror to mankind, as had occurred in the third year of the 107th Olympiad when King Philip was throwing Greece into disturbance. My own view is that these occurrences take place at fixed dates owing to natural forces, like all other events, and not, as most people think, from the variety of causes invented by the cleverness of human intellects. It is true that they were the harbingers of enormous misfortunes, but I hold that those did not happen because the marvelous occurrences took place, but that these only took place because the misfortunes were going to occur. Only the reason for their occurrence is concealed by their rarity, and consequently it is not understood as are the risings and settings of the planets described above and many other of these phenomena. Chapter 28. Now he's referring to atmospheric phenomena like sun, sun dogs and sun bows. Stars are also seen throughout the daytime in company with the sun, usually actually surrounding the sun's orb like wreaths made of ears of corn and rings of a changing color. For instance, when Augustus Caesar in early manhood entered the city after the death of his father to assume his mighty surname. Similar halos occur around the moon and around the principal fixed stars. 
Chapter 29. A bow appeared around the sun in the consulship of Lucius Opimius and of Quintus Fabius, a hoop in that of Gaius Porcius and Manius Achilius, and a red ring appeared during the consulship of Lucius Julius and Publius Rutilius. Chapter 30. Portentous and protracted eclipses of the sun occur, such as one after the murder of Caesar the dictator and during the Antonine War, which caused almost a whole year's continuous gloom. 31. Again, several multiple suns are seen at once, neither above nor below the real sun, but at an angle with it, never alongside of nor opposite to the earth, and not at night, but either at sunrise or at sunset. It is also reported that once several suns were seen at midday at the Bosphorus, and that these lasted from dawn until sunset. In former times, three suns have been seen at once. For example, in the consulships of Spurius Postumius and Quintus Mucius, of Quintus Marcius and Marcus Porcius, of Marcus Antonius and Publius de la Bella, and of Marcus Lepidus and Lucius Plancus, and our generation saw this during the principate of his late majesty Claudius, in the consulship when Cornelius Ortifius, Ortifus was his colleague. It is not stated that more than three sons at a time have ever been seen hitherto. Chapter 32. Also three moons have appeared at once. For instance, in the consulship of Gnaeus Domitius, and of Gaius Fanius. 33. A light from the sky by night, the phenomenon usually called night suns, was seen in the consulship of Gaius Caecilius and Gnaeus Papirius, and often on other occasions causing apparent daylight during the night. Chapter 34. In the consulship of Lucius Valerius and Gaius Marius, a burning shield, scattering sparks, ran across the sky at sunset from west to east. Chapter 35. Another UFO UAP report. Uh, in the consulship of Gaius Octavius and Gaius Scribonius, a spark was seen to fall from a star and increase in size as it approached the earth, and after becoming as large as the moon, it diffused a sort of cloudy daylight, and then returning to the sky changed into a torch. This is the only record of this occurring. It was seen by the proconsul Silanus and his suite. Chapter 36 also, stars appear to shoot to and fro. This invariably portends the rise of a fierce hurricane from the same quarter. And chapter 37. Stars also come into existence at sea and on land. I have seen a radiance of star-like appearance clinging to the javelins of soldiers on sentry duty at night in front of the rampart and on a voyage stars alight on the yards and other parts of the ship with a sound resembling a voice, hopping from perch to perch in the manner of birds. These, when they come singly, are disastrously heavy, and they wreck ships, and if they fall into the hold, they burn them up. But if there are two of these, they denote safety, and they portend a successful voyage and their approach is said to put to flight the terrible star called Helena. For this reason they are called Castor and Pollux, and people pray to them as gods for aid at sea. They also shine round men's heads at evening time. This is a great portent. All these things admit of no certain explanation. They are hidden away in the grandeur of nature.